Hello and welcome to Data Research Labs. For today's SQL Server tip, we're going to discuss how to analyze a query execution plan, what they are and why you should know how to use them. And a quick note, all this material is Creative Commons license, free for you to reuse within your organization. And this presentation exists as a PDF out on the GitHub site. A link is posted below in the YouTube description. First up, what is a query execution plan? So what is a query execution plan? Well, Redgate has the best definition in orange here. It's a way to calculate the most efficient way to implement a T-SQL query. There are three visual formats for execution plans. The most common is a graphical execution plan, and that's what this video is about. They're the easiest to read, but they have the lowest level of detail. The second visual format is text execution plans. There's more detail, but they're more difficult to read. And the third visual format is XML execution plans. They're the hardest to read, but they give the most detail. And that's natively how uh, SQL Server saves XML plans for future reference in tables. So there's three time points at which execution plans can be captured. There's before, during, and after. So here is a before estimated execution plan. It's the furthest leftmost button here with the little uh, boxes. And you can also click the query menu and display estimated execution plan. This is less accurate, but it's virtually instant. You don't have to run the query for 15 minutes to get the plan. You just click the button and you get the estimated execution plan. And 99% of the time, the estimated execution plan is going to be the same thing as the actual execution plan. You just don't have to wait. So frequently, you'll want to just click that button and get the estimated execution plan. There are times when you're troubleshooting a performance issue using the query execution plan that you need to take an after execution plan, which is the include actual execution plan. It's this little button here. This was show estimated. This is include actual plan. And this one we're gonna see in a minute is the live plan. You can also click the query menu and click the include actual execution plan. And it's a toggle, it's like a checkbox. You click it down and then you click the green triangle to run your SQL statement in SSMS. And why you would want the include actual execution plan is because then you'll get the actual number of rows, which you can compare to the estimated number of rows. And sometimes those are different. And when they're different, it can be a big deal. We'll learn about that later, but that's how you do take an after or an actual execution plan. And finally, you can take an execution plan during the query. So if you have a 15 minute query, you can tick the include live query stats button here, it has a little green check mark on it, or you can do the query menu and include live, include live query statistics. It's more accurate than the show estimated plan. And the important part is you get the results while they're running. You can actually see the numbers progress in increment. So if you have multiple queries, 10 queries, and hundreds of objects on the screen, you can see right where the bottleneck occurs as the data flows through the system. That's a situation where you'd use the live query stats. And we'll see an example of that later as well. Just so you're aware, there's two other types of execution plans, but we won't be dealing with them in this training video. There's cache plans in SQL memory and log plans as an XML uh, string in a table. Here's a sample screenshot of a graphical query execution plan. Notice the tab section at top with the execution plan tab. And notice the SQL text section right below that. It just has one line of SQL. You may have 50 or 100 lines of SQL, but just the top line will be shown here. And most importantly, notice the execution plan flowchart section right below that. And those operator objects that you see, they can go to the right pages and pages, and they can go down pages and pages. Next up, how to read a query execution plan. So how do you read a query execution plan? Well, we'll start with some assumptions. First, you have to have permissions to read it. And that requires that you have a grant show plan to John Doe or whatever your name is. And the DBAs or someone with permissions will have to grant that to you if you don't already have it. And the second assumption is that you read the flow chart top to bottom, the little blue one circle there, and right to left, the blue two circle. So what are the objects on the flow chart? Well, first up, all the little icons here are called operators. And each operator is named. And there's approximately 78 operator types. In general, you'll ignore the select operator at the far left because it just signifies the end of the flow because you're reading from the right to left. But of course, this is an exception because it has a yellow triangle. We'll learn about that later. Arrows indicate the data flow direction. 
and the thickness of arrows indicates the relative amount of data flowing through each of the lines. So here, for example, there's fewer rows, and here there's far more rows. The relative thickness shows you the size of the flow. And you can hover a mouse pointer over a row to get the actual count of rows that went through that flow. The cost percent indicator below each operator indicates the relative cost of the given operator to the given query. So if you have 100% of this query, then each of these, that's 5% of the overall query. And as much of the query SQL as possible that can be displayed in one line is shown right there at the top above the flowchart area. And this is handy in cases where you have query one, below that query two, below that query three. You may wonder which query am I, which query's execution plan am I looking at when you run a whole batch of queries. Another aspect of reading a query execution plan is the object tooltip details. When you hover over an object, a yellow tooltips type of a dialog pops up. And that has a whole bunch of details showing the cache plan size and the memory use, the estimated operator cost that's the same as the percentage that you see below. The zero here is the same as the zero here. It gives you the estimated number of rows, one in this case, but that can be really useful when you have a lot, a lot of rows. And then it'll give you the SQL statement. If we hover over the second operator to the right, the compute scalar operator, notice the different details for a different object. It does show the same estimated number of rows, just like the select operator, but the there's a difference because there's multiple estimated costs and other estimated values listed out here in the yellow tooltip box. You can also right click the properties and that'll pop up a properties dialog which has a lot more detail or information than the tooltips yellow dialog has. Next up, how to identify warnings. How to identify warnings? Well, you have to run an estimator or actual plan and then check for the little yellow triangle warning sign at a given operator. And if you see that little yellow triangle, you know you have a warning. So if you hover over the operator with the warning, the tooltips will pop up and you can review the details and you'll see a warning section. And an example is an implicit type conversion that's gonna force a table scan. Or another example is that tempdb is spilling the data over during execution. And those are all warnings that you wanna be aware of because you may go uh, find a fix for it. And there's many, many other types of warnings that can show up here. You can also check for a missing index warning. The green text that's up here, it'll tell you that you should, it'll make a suggestion. You should create a non-clustered index. It'll give you the table name, the fields that you should add, etc. And uh, this warning precludes the need to watch for lookups where an index should have fields added to avoid looking back at a table. So this here is what a lookup looks like. You have an index seek and then a key lookup because the index had say two fields, but we needed to go and look up on the clustered index, all the matches and fetch four additional fields. And you don't have to look for this scenario anymore because the green text tells you, oh, create a non-clustered index and add these columns. Next up, how to identify the slowest operator. So how do you identify the slowest operator? Well, first you have to run an estimated or actual plan, get the graphical plan, and then you go find the biggest percent cost, like 55% here, that operator in our sample. And then you op optimize the SQL so that this percent goes down. And there's many different things you can do. It depends on whatever the issue is. But that's how you find it, and then you fix it, and then you repeat and find the next biggest percent cost and so on until you get the whole query optimized to a point that it's running fast enough for you. And this process works well when the query execution time is a minute or less. If it's a much longer running query, say 60 minutes, you don't wanna wait till the end to find what operator is slow. So in those situations, you tick the include with live query stats, this little button up here, and then you don't have to wait. In our example here, you can see which operator is running slow in real time. It's the percent cost and it moves slowly. So when I fired up this query, these all were at 0% and then this one started ticking and you can see that it's only at 12% and it was eight seconds in when I took the screenshot. So you can quickly scroll through the data flow and see, oh, no data, no data, no data. You just work your way backwards or go all the way to the right and just see, you know, the furthest right element is 100% done. The data's 
then pass through that operator. Then you go to the one to the left and you'll quickly find where the bottleneck is. And then you can look at the bottleneck and make a decision, stop the query, go optimize it, come back in and rerun it. And it's especially handy when right here I have one query and it's just one row, it's not very big, and it's what, two, four, six operators. But sometimes you'll have 30 queries in a batch run with query one and a group of operators, query two, query three, and it'll go for pages. And using the live operator, live query statistics trick lets you really quickly see that, oh, query one, two, three, four are done. Oh, I'm on query five and I'm somewhere halfway in between, and that's where the bottleneck is. So, really important trick on a bigger batch script to identify where a bottleneck is and go fix it. And here's an example of a large multi-query script where you have query one is done, its progress is 100% green, query two is done, its progress is 100% green, but query three is stalled out, it's 11% done, and we just scroll over to the right and we find, oh, there's the bottleneck, it's at this operator at that step, and oh, I need an index or whatever the issue is, you'll find it quickly when you use this technique. Next up, how to identify and fix table scans or clustered index scans. How to identify and fix scans. Well, before we get started, an important note. Much of the time, a table scan or a clustered index scan is okay and cannot be further optimized. So don't assume that seeing one is a red flag. You have to analyze to be sure. But as many times as they aren't an issue because it's a small table or a small clustered index and you can't do anything about it, other times, it is a red flag and you should put an index on so that you do five hops through a million row table to find your solution and not table scan through a million rows. So table scans and clustered index scans, they can be an easy fix, low hanging fruit, but other times there's nothing you can do about them. They're okay or it is what it is. So we're going to learn about how to analyze those. So you find a table scan operator by looking for an operator that's labeled table scan has this little icon and it'll have the table name below it. How do you fix a table scan? Well, it depends. You ignore it for small tables. If there's few rows or there's a few columns and less than 100,000 rows, that's going to fit in memory. There's no point in trying to get tricky and add indexes. Just ignore it. Leave the table scan. It's fine. However, if it's a large table, then you need to resolve it. And you'll know because the percent cost is high and the query runs slow. So you'll know that's when you should fix it. How to fix a table scan? Well, one way is to create a clustered index for a primary key. If you have a table with no index, then it's always gonna be a table scan. And if you have millions of rows, that's gonna be a penalty. You're gonna want an index so that within five or 10 hops, you can find a row. So creating clustered index, if none exists, is a great way to fix a table scan. Another way to fix a table scan is to add a where clause. If someone's returning all rows, but doesn't need to be, well, add a where clause. You only need to return three rows, not 50,000. That's two fixes for a table scan operator. A close relative to a table scan is a clustered index scan. And that's basically the index in which the table rows are naturally stored. And typically it's the it matches the primary key. A clustered index is, matches the same columns as the primary key. And in order to see if a clustered index scan should be, to, to find one, you have to run an actual plan. And then you have to find the clustered index scan operator. It'll look something like this and it'll have a uh, table name and a, well, I guess a clustered index name. And how do you know whether or not you need to fix that clustered index scan? Well, like a table scan, it depends. If it's a small table with few rows and less than 100, or few columns and less than 100,000 rows, you don't need to bother. It'll all just fit in memory and an index scan is fine. But for larger tables, either number of rows or wide columns, uh, then you should probably fix it. And you'll know because again, the percent cost is high and the time is slow. So how do you fix a clustered index scan? Well, you create or fix a non-clustered index to include the extra fields. So what's going on is your, your select statement, where clause, whatever, it's the operator is gone in, it's used the clustered index to scan and find the 15 records it needs out of 5 million, but it only has the primary key field values. It doesn't have the other 10 fields that it needs for those 15 rows. So if you make a covering index, a non-clustered index that matches the cluster, but tacks on additional fields, then SQL Server will use that index and in one pass, find the 15 rows 
and then also have the 10 columns that it needs and it won't have to do two lookups. It'll get it all in one lookup. Next up, how to identify and fix spools or sorts. What are spool operators? Well, you look for three different types of spool operators, an index spool, a table spool that's eager, or a table spool that's lazy. And table spools act like a cache to the query processor. They store temporary results. Why are spool operators bad? Because they're slow. They're implemented as tempdb tables in the process and it impacts performance. And how do you fix it? Well, this whole section came from Adam Mechanic and a presentation he did. And I'm putting a link, this YouTube link, down below in the description of this presentation. And you can go watch that. But in general, you add a distinct to the query so that it forces the caching not to occur or you rearrange the SQL logic. So there's a couple of things you can do, but I recommend you look at his video to get the full details. So how to identify and fix sorts? Well, first you gotta start out by finding the sort. And a sort operator looks like this, has a little A to Z and it'll say sort below it. And sort operators are used by an order by clause in your SQL or merge joins or stream aggregates or windowing functions. So a lot of different reasons why sort operators are used. Why are sort operators bad? Because they're slow and they perform worse and worse as the size increases. How do you fix it? Well, you can't really just remove the sort unless you really need to do it. There are times when people put a sort or an order by at the end of their SQL just because they're testing out the code as they're going along developers, but they don't really need the order by because they're going to take those results and bring them up to the display layer and they could order it there much faster and easier and not put the load on the SQL box. So watch this one and remove it if you don't need it. Next up, how to identify and fix missing or stale statistics. So this one's a classic, how to identify and fix missing or stale statistics. This is typically happens when you have a query that runs day after day, takes just five or 10 seconds, and then you come in after a month of it running and one day it takes 35 minutes. What the heck happened? Most likely the statistics got stale and then your indexes weren't properly being used. So. What are statistics? Well, in SQL Server Management Studio, each table object, table up here, blurred out, has columns, keys, constraints, but it has a statistics folder. And in the statistics folder are basically for all the different fields, the statistics. And those statistics are basically a frequency distribution of all the values for that column. So I've popped open a column here, the statistic name, and there's all the values for the column and then counts like a histogram so it gives me a count of how frequently that given range is occurring and it's also known as cardinality why does statistics matter because the query optimizer uses statistics to estimate the number of rows returned by the predicates what's a predicate it's the logic expression in a where clause each of the different fields and, and that make it up so the problem is that if the statistics are missing or inaccurate, then the optimizer will often table scan. It won't choose to use the index. And that can be up to a thousand times slower than an index seat. If you think about it, if you're doing a join, for example, or a where clause or a group by, and you just need to deal with four or five columns, not all one million of them that a table scan would entail. You could use the index and find the four or five that you need to join on or group on or whatever. And so you can tell that it's going to be thousands of times faster. And that's why you get that big jump from a query running for five seconds. All of a sudden it spikes up to 60 minutes and you wonder what happened. Well, what happened is it's table scanning, not using the indexes. So how do you spot inaccurate statistics and know without a shadow of a doubt that that's the cause behind the slowdown? Well, you right click a given operator to view uh, on the actual query execution plan to view the tool tips. And then you compare the estimated number of rows versus the actual number of rows. And if the estimated number of rows is giant because SQL Server doesn't know any better and thinks it's going to table scan, but the actual number of rows is tiny, then that's a great indicator that it's got stale statistics and it's not using the index. This was on the MCSE exam and there's a slight chance I got this reversed. I can't remember and I tried Googling it and gave up after a couple minutes. It might be that the actual number of rows is giant and the estimated number of rows is small. I can't remember for sure, but absolutely. It's when you have one of these is large and one of these is small. It's that delta 
that tells you it's not using the statistics. So look for that. Look for one estimated or actual number of rows being big and the other being small. Next presentation that's down in the description below this video. He mentioned that nested loops are also an uh, indicator of missing or stale statistics. It's a signature of that. So look for nested loops. So how do you fix inaccurate statistics? Well, number one is the auto update statistics. Set it to true and SQL Server will take care of itself and update the statistics as needed. Uh, secondly, for large tables, DBAs may schedule maintenance jobs to run the update statistics during off hours when there's no activity or minimal activity. And third, sometimes you just have complex SQL join logic that's, that's uh, sensitive to lots of data coming in. And in those situations, you're not going to be wanting to update statistics all the time. You may need to go split apart your SQL and refactor your SQL so it's not so sensitive and doesn't have so many joins. Use a CTE common table expression or do different things to simplify your SQL and break it out into sections. And don't have 16 tables in one giant join where you're really sensitive to the statistics. Uh, the SQL per SQLperformance.com link below in this YouTube video that has a, a bunch of great suggestions for how to fix the statistics. And finally, how to identify common issues automatically. And finally, if all else fails, SQL Server does have a built-in analyzer feature that you can click on that'll do the work for you and it'll find common issues and list them out. So you run an actual plan, has to be an actual, not estimated, and then you right click in this white space anywhere on that execution plan. And when you do so, a menu will pop up and you select an analyze actual execution plan from that pop-up menu. And then that will give you a show plan analysis dialog where SQL Server did the analysis work for you. And in this example, it found one issue in blue, but it can find multiple issues. And then over to the right, there's a finding details and you can click that and that'll pop up a scenario explanation with a whole bunch of details about what that issue is that it found and gives you some details on how to, how to fix it. Thank you for watching and please, if you found this video helpful, click like or even better, click subscribe to increase this channel's reach.